Hello and welcome to this presentation on China's Year of the Slaughtered Pig. My name is Chris Quill and I'm the Institute's Quantitative Analyst and I'm also in charge of much of the research and data that we put out as well. So here's what I'm going to cover in this talk. Essentially, we're going to look at the biggest problem China's economy is facing today, which is a massive accumulation of debt. We'll take a look at what makes that debt issue so problematic and I'll also cover a few reasons as to why I think it's becoming quite an acute issue right now. And then lastly, I'll cover a few examples of trade ideas given the macro analysis on China's economy that we've been through. Now, before I kick it off, just be aware that the purpose of this presentation isn't to spoon feed you guys ideas, but it is about giving you an idea of the process of going from developing a macroeconomic thesis and subsequently generating potential trades from that analysis. So as I said previously, debt is a massive issue in the Chinese economy. And if you look at the chart on the right for some perspective, you can see that China's been growing around 10% annually in real terms for the last 30 years. And it appears to have been relatively unscathed by the global financial crisis in 2008. However, what actually happened was that it initiated massive monetary and fiscal stimulus measures to actually get through that period in 2008 with such high apparent growth. And as a consequence, their debt levels skyrocketed. So if you look at the chart on the left, it shows debt to GDP statistics from the Bank of International Settlements. And you can see from the period 2008 to 2018, so the last 10 years or so, China's non-financial sector credit to GDP has increased by about 110%, 90% of which was from the private sector. And if you dig a bit deeper into that private sector data, you'll see that corporations are responsible for most of that credit. But it's also important to note that households have seen a very large increase uh, as well and have basically tripled their debt in GDP terms. Now, if you were to look at China's total debt levels, they aren't actually too dissimilar to many advanced economies around the world, which you can see on the chart here represented by the purple dots. However, when considering financial crises, it's not the absolute or total debt levels that matter. It's the rate of change in credit growth that's a much better indicator than those absolute levels. So the green bars in this chart represent the increase in debt to GDP of various regions around the world over the last 10 years. And you can see that China is way out in front, both in terms of total non-financial sector debt, and even more so if you consider just the private sector. So how much does this matter? Well, a number of empirical studies shed light on that, and I've picked out two here. The first of which is one from the International Monetary Fund, who found that there are 43 cases of credit booms over the period that they studied, uh, as identified by debt to GDP ratios, uh, ratio increases of 30% or more in five years. Only five of those ended without major slowdowns in growth or a financial crisis, and none of those nations that they analyzed in their sample started with a higher absolute debt to GDP ratio uh, than 100%, which China has done. The second study that I want to point out is one from the Bank of International Settlements. They look at various early warning indicators for banking crises, uh, two of which are the debt to GDP ratio and debt service ratios. And they base their analytics on the deviation from the trend in these ratios. And empirically, their models have captured about 90% of crises with a three-year prediction horizon. And rather worryingly, in their 2018 report, China posted values that were four times the threshold for debt to GDP uh, for predicting a banking crisis and 10 times the threshold for a banking crisis in terms of their debt service ratio. So that's some pretty compelling evidence for the overarching debt problem in China. But when it comes to you guys doing your own macro research, you can't just rely on some headline numbers and a few studies. You're going to have to dig a bit deeper. So that's what we're going to do now by looking at what makes China's debt so vulnerable.
The first point here is that much of the credit created in China is funneled into gross capital formation, which is essentially investment in infrastructure. And that's been a key driver of economic growth for, for years. The chart on the left shows just how much more reliant China is on gross capital formation compared to other nations over the last 30 or 40 years or so. And the trouble is that the efficiency of that investment has decreased significantly. The incremental capital output ratio, which is the chart on the right hand side, measures how much investment in gross capital formation is required for a corresponding unit in economic growth. And you can see in that chart that that value has doubled from about three to seven in the last 10 years. Or in other words, in simple terms, the efficiency or return on investment has halved over that period. So to understand why credit continues to be allocated inefficiently in China, you need to know something about their structure of governance. And the problem seems to stem from the local level of government. So local government officials tend to be judged in terms of promotion prospects on two key things. First of all, the GDP figures that they output. And second of all, whether they maintain social order or not. And that is very high up on the agenda for the Chinese Communist Party. And there's strong incentives for these local government officials to game the system. That's due to two key things. First of all, they have relatively short political terms in office. And that means that there's a lack of accountability for the policies that they introduce because they won't be there to see them through and see the outcome of those policies before moving on to their next position. Secondly, federal government budgets are skewed against local government best interests. Now, let me explain exactly what that means. Essentially, it comes down to the fact that local governments are responsible for about 80% of public spending, but they're only entitled to 50% of local revenues. So there's a real mismatch or imbalance in the local government budgets. And these governance issues have resulted in a number of unfavorable long-term outcomes. The first of which that I wanna to discuss today is an excess capacity in industry. So zombie companies, which are companies that don't really turn a profit, are kept alive purely for the purposes of generating tax revenues uh, because those tax revenues can be generated on uh, the company or corporate revenues, not just their profits. And they're also kept alive to avoid unemployment issues. Again, that falls under the banner of maintaining social order. And to put the problem into perspective in terms of excess capacity in many industrial sectors in China, if we take a look at what happened to China's steel industry in 2015, they produced about half the global requirement of steel in terms of usage and steel prices in that year in China were driven lower than the price of cabbage. And even at that point, they were still only producing at about 70% of their capacity. The second undesirable outcome from this imbalance in local government budgets is a reliance on land. So the reliance on land stems from a shortfall in the tax revenues that they generate, as we've already discussed. And what happens is local governments tend to seize land from local agriculture to use it for public works, to subsidize and attract local businesses, and to use it as collateral to raise debt, all in an effort, obviously, to boost their GDP numbers for their promotion prospects. And the third and final outcome here is that there's now an excess capacity in infrastructure and housing. So as you can imagine, public works are the quickest and easiest way for officials to boost their economic numbers. And over the last 20, 30 years, there's been an excuse to put a lot of money into infrastructure and housing because there's a massive requirement for urbanization and a huge underlying um, population. But now that's just being used as an excuse to build excess capacities in cities where entire districts are built just in the blind pursuit of growth before any real demand exists. And you may have heard of ghost cities, which are the result of this sort of behavior. And again, just to give you an idea of how insane it can get, the deputy head of the China Center for Urban Development said in 2013 
that plans for new cities and districts were sufficient to house 3.4 billion people, which is more than double the entire population. The final point I want to make about inefficient credit allocation towards industrial sectors and infrastructure in China is to debunk an often used counter-argument. There are those that are more optimistic about the situation in China that point to an argument that new policies are coming into play that should allocate resources more efficiently and shift the economy to be more consumer-led rather than piling money into infrastructure where it isn't required. Now, while that may be true, I've provided here some empirical evidence of what tends to happen to countries as they go through their peak in gross capital formation and then become more consumer driven. And essentially, if you look at the chart, the blue bars represent the average GDP growth of several countries prior to their peak in gross capital formation and the orange and green bars represent their GDP growth afterwards. And simply put, it shows that as nations mature to a consumer-driven economy, typically we'll see their average growth reduced to about half or, or more of what it was previously. And these results are typical across larger samples as well. So the reformation argument isn't exactly the best in terms of trying to develop a bullish outlook on China. Another major vulnerability for China's economy is their reliance on real estate. Now, very briefly, rising real estate prices are essential for stable debt and economic growth, as they are in many economies around the world. And in China, they account for a massive proportion of loans, collateral, household wealth, and they're also essential for land sales as well, which we've discussed briefly before. Uh, is very important to government revenues and helps keep them running this facade of financial health. So what's the problem with this reliance on real estate? Well, the first one that I want to discuss stems from the fact that there's two distinct property markets in China. If you look at major cities, they're facing a serious affordability problem. And you can see in the chart on the right hand side there, that China's major cities are amongst the most expensive to live in in the world. And on the other side of the coin, smaller cities have excess housing capacity, the kind we discussed earlier, and prices are subject to heavy discounts. So for example, Country Garden Holdings, a major Chinese property developer, was forced to cut prices by around 30% at two of their projects in a couple of cities in late 2018. And as you can imagine, that sparked angry protests by those who had paid the full price for those properties previously. And that's important to consider because as we've already discussed, a key part of the Chinese Communist Party agenda is maintaining social order. Now, in terms of monetary policy solutions, this presents a bit of a dilemma because if rates are reduced, then house prices are likely to increase, which won't help the affordability problem in major cities. But on the other hand, if rates are increased, then demand for housing in tier two and tier three cities will be even lower, leading to further discounts. And either way, I would argue here that there's a distinct possibility for social unrest, which, as I said, is something that the Chinese Communist Party is acutely sensitive to. To add to that issue, around 20% of housing stocks are empty. Now, obviously, part of that's due to the excess capacity in ghost cities, but that figure of 20% isn't much different for tier one cities either. And that's because housing's being used increasingly as both a store of value and as collateral for loans. And there's this inherent complacency in China that house prices will continue increasing at a rapid pace to the point where many of the properties aren't even being used to collect yield or rent, and therefore they remain empty. And in addition to that problem, the proportion of second and third home purchases in China hit record highs in 2018. And rather unsurprisingly as well, home ownership is also very high at around 73%. Now what all that means is that should there be a slowdown in real estate prices, it doesn't look like there's going to be many buyers to step in and fill the void of demand. So if confidence and liquidity becomes a worry, it could get messy very fast. And the fact that real estate prices penetrate so much of the economy means there is a significant systemic risk here.
The trend in demographics is another problem. Granted, it's more of a long-term issue, but a very powerful one nonetheless. And China is essentially on the precipice of a demographic cliff here, and it's one of the fastest aging countries in the world. So from now onwards, the working age population in China is set to decline, and at the same time, dependents in the society are set to increase. So dependents being those that are either too young or too old to work. And what that means is we can expect lower productivity going forward because obviously there's a lower workforce and also more pressure on the financial system because with a higher percentage of dependents to working age population that's going to mean more withdrawals and less deposits into the financial system. And to provide a bit of perspective here, I've overlaid Japan's demographic profile from around 20 years ago onto China's today, which you can see um, they are very similar. And on the right hand side, I've got a chart that shows average real GDP growth levels for Japan, along with their working age population. And you can see that around the time of the peak in working age population and thereafter, Japan's real GDP growth fell by roughly two thirds. So if Japan is a good approximation for China's growth outlook going forward, then we won't be looking at six, seven or eight percent in real GDP terms. But instead, we're looking at growth that's closer to three or four percent. The fourth and final vulnerability that I'm going to talk about today is China's shadow banking sector. So our considerations so far in this presentation have only included China's visible debt. Now shadow banking refers to non-bank credit that isn't subject to the same regulation as ordinary bank lending and it's actually estimated to be quite large at around 70% of GDP and that compounds the debt problem in several ways. First of all, obviously overall debt to GDP is higher than official statistics would suggest. Secondly, much of that credit is unregulated, which reduces the safety net in an outcome of crisis. So, for example, shadow products don't require a reserve ratio to cover defaults or liquidity issues. And there's an increase of contagion risk since often if a company can't post the collateral required for a loan, then they can seek guarantees from other firms to help them raise money. Thirdly, a large portion of the sector, around 40% or so, is made up of wealth management products. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but essentially they're packaged loans and bonds that are quite often low in quality, and they're sold on to investors and the general public on the assumption of higher returns than a bank deposit, but lower risk through diversification. Now, for those of you that know a little bit about the global financial crisis in 2008, this should be ringing alarm bells. So up to this point, we've established credit growth as a significant risk to the Chinese economy and marked out some particular vulnerabilities that add to the issue. Now what I want to do is point out a few reasons as to why I think these problems may come to surface sooner rather than later. And the first of which that I want to cover is this catch-22 situation that China is now facing when it comes to shadow financing. Let me explain a bit further. So in 2017, Xi Jinping announced a new era of quality over quantity in terms of economic growth, which largely involved regulating the financial sector and the shadow banking sector in particular. And to a large extent, it works. If you look back on the previous slide, you'll see that the orange dots on that chart represent the size of the shadow banking sector as a percentage of GDP and over the last few years that has been decreasing. But whilst that policy curtailed the debt issue a little bit, it wasn't without consequence and in actual fact small firms are very reliant on shadow financing. So as with many economies around the world, small firms account for the majority of economic output in China. And like I said, they're struggling to get the financing they need um, through official channels. So they rely heavily on the shadow financing sector. And you can see from the chart there that the demand for loans, particularly in small firms, has increased fairly significantly from when these policies were introduced. So therein lies the issue. Uh, that's the shadow financing catch 22. We're now at the stage where either there's a continued clampdown down 
uh, on shadow financing, which inevitably impacts GDP growth, especially through these small firms not being able to get the loans that they need, or if they start to deregulate um, and, and go back on the changes that they made surrounding the shadow financing sector, then potentially they risk financial stability through uncontrolled debt growth, which is the reason why they actually introduced these policies in the first place. The second issue I want to address here is the positive bounce in economic data that happened in Q1 of this year, which was a result of, or largely a result of the latest round of fiscal stimulus and credit growth in the economy. Now, on the face of it, that would seem like quite good news for markets, and initially it was interpreted that way, but I think that that's a bit of a red herring, and here's why. So firstly, a relatively low amount of the credit created is actually being used for long-term financing, which is the kind of financing you would associate with effective investment. And in actual fact, much more of it uh, on a proportional basis, when you look back historically, is being used for short-term financing, which is basically um, most likely for cash flow purposes and paying down interest payments on prior credit. Secondly, if you look at the chart in the bottom right, when government spending increased quickly to fuel economic growth, it was primarily directed at state-owned enterprises, which typically have a much poorer return on investment than private companies, which we kind of touched on earlier in the presentation as well. So the point here is that although stimulus has resulted in positive headline results in Q1 of this year, I would argue that if you dig a bit deeper into the data, it's actually just another reminder of the difficulties that China is facing. If you remember back to the earlier slides in this presentation, I spoke about the importance of real estate prices to China's economy. And now it seems to be showing early signs of slowing down. So if you look at the chart on the left, what that shows is the growth in house prices in China over the last sort of uh, six, seven years. And although it doesn't really look problematic yet, it is slowing. And with expectations of capital appreciation being so high, any decline in growth could easily affect confidence and therefore liquidity going forward. So when there is this inherent complacency about house prices rising at say 10% per year in real terms, on any trend that falls below that and is declining as it is now, there is a chance it would affect confidence and liquidity and that in turn could create problems for debt, for example. The other chart on the right hand side shows another bit of interesting data that I found on real estate and that basically shows how property transactions are typically correlated uh, negatively to changes in rates, uh, which is as you'd expect. So any sort of fall in rates typically we'd expect to see a rise in house price in a rise in house prices and a rise in uh, sales of houses and property transactions in general but recently that trend has weakened somewhat and i would suggest that that's evidence that monetary policy may not be as effective as it once was you will also remember that I mentioned earlier how important land was to local government revenues and financing investment-led growth. So if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you'll be able to see that land sales are becoming an increasing portion of total local government revenues. So land sales now account for around 30% of local government revenues, whereas a few years ago, that was closer to 20%. And to add to that, land sales themselves have started to fall sharply in Q1 of this year, which you will see in the right hand chart. So now we have a situation where local governments are more reliant than they've ever been on land sales, but the sales themselves are decreasing. There's also cracks in the wider economy. If you look at aggregate demand, which I've estimated in the left hand chart there by adding fixed asset investment, retail sales and exports, that value, that index value is pretty much the lowest that it's been in 20 years. Another way of judging demand in the economy is by looking at imports from key trading partners into, uh, into China. And you can see that on a year on year basis in the chart on the right hand side, uh, imports from key trading partners are actually shrinking. 
Now, granted, uh, some of you might be thinking that, yeah, well, obviously there's a trade war going on with the US, but even if you strip out the US data and just look at the other key trading partners, so the EU, Australia, Japan, South Korea, um, those imports from those nations or those areas are also shrinking on a year-on-year -year basis. So it still holds true across many different key trading partners. Another problem that China started to face more recently is the prospect of running twin deficits in both the current account and the fiscal balance. So for those of you that don't know, the current account measures the net trade in goods and services of an economy. And as you would expect with China on a historical basis, they've run a, a large surplus due to uh, exporting far more than they import and being the sort of factory floor for the world for so long. Um, but now it looks like it's actually trending towards a deficit, so importing more than they export. Obviously, that means that there's now less export-led growth and so the result is that there's more pressure on uh, domestic consumer-led demand or consumer-led growth. As well as that, the fiscal balance, which is government revenues minus government expenditures, continues to run a large deficit. Now, historically, China's run a large fiscal deficit uh, to fund their infrastructure and investment-led spending or growth. And it's managed to do that by printing money and supporting the exchange rate by using its large foreign currency reserves that have accumulated from decades of their current account surplus, so by exporting uh, more than they import. However, now there's a few issues that are coming into play with, with this structure. Firstly, although the true values of foreign currency reserves are unknown, some analysts are estimating that those reserves in China are well below adequate levels should a crisis occur. And the second issue is that, as we've already discussed, the problem with investment-led growth is the diminishing return on investment that you get, um, that you get for your spending on, on gross capital formation. And to stimulate a shift towards a consumer-led economy uh, will likely require things like tax cuts, and that puts even more pressure on the fiscal balance, which is already uh, at a large deficit. So these two issues essentially point to a lack of policy flexibility going forward and particularly when it comes to their currency.